Yeah, it's been it's been very weird because I like being busy and I'm very lucky that I've been busy for coming up to 30 years now in this career. And I went to Cheltenham for two days. So sitting in my chair on Thursday night, my phone buzzed and it said, obviously, Mikel Arteta's been tested positive and that was it. I basically didn't work for two and a half months. There were people clearly fighting for their lives, people whose businesses and enterprises were and still are in massive trouble. So I think that put it into perspective very quickly that you've just got to, to sit tight and, and, and ride it out as best you can. And then it became clear that they wanted to get the football going again. But it's very weird to be, I mean, my wife said to me, I've seen you every day for 60 days. Quite often I don't see you for six weeks. This is bizarre. <laughs> but anyway, at least we agreed that probably we'd be all right in retirement because, you know, we, we have quite a lot of common interests. Yeah. I mean, being a reporter in, in lockdown, I mean, if you can't go out and do that, I mean, does that mean a lot of domestic stuff or does that mean you can do a lot more research? I mean, what do you do? I think, I think I've played classic lockdown bingo. I've grown a beard for the first time. I've learned to bake bread. I've been taught to play poker badly. Um, I've been gardening. I mean, as I say, I think it's absolutely classic. It sounds like a, a male midlife crisis, really, doesn't it? Just throwing a motorbike, and it probably would be. But it's been nice in that in that respect to do to think about something different because I couldn't really think about work because there was literally nothing to do. I was doing a little bit for PLP, literally sitting where I am now. We were doing little mm. programs, half hour programs, a couple of times a week. You know, classic matches. We had. Ian Wright and Emil Heskey talking about the famous Burkamp hat trick match at Filbert Street. So I was doing a little bit like that, but on, on the whole, there wasn't really anything I could do. So what's the buzz around the media camp, camp at the moment? Are people kind of just so, so desperate to get back to doing what they do? I think people are as fascinated to know um, how it's going to play out in terms of home advantage, because we look at the Bundesliga results. I mean, I was at a, P a Premier League meeting this morning, um, Who's going who's gonna to play the canned music? You can play canned music if you want. You can even play songs dedicated to a particular player. How's that going to look? What players are going to respond to the lack of atmosphere and who won't? Uh, when I was at PLP last week, I was with Ian Wright. Obviously, you love Tim Sherwood. And Glenn Hoddle came on. Glenn Hoddle made a brilliant point. and Because I asked him this question. I said, Glenn, we've all heard about players who are brilliant in training but can't hack it on a Saturday afternoon. They can't take the match day uh, environment. Maybe they're going to flourish because they're not going to be given a hard time by anybody. He said, it's really interesting how many players it comes from within. What, what drives them is their own professional standards and their professional pride. And he said he did have some experience of this, and there's obviously a link with Arsenal here, but when he played for Wenger in Monaco, sometimes they only have four or 5,000 people in the winter. Mm -hmm. so there's no way... You, you, a lot of you would have gone to the, uh, I did the, the Monaco game three, four years ago. You know, in the Champions League, you know how small the ground is. So uh, in that situation, there was no way that he and Mark Hayden, who was playing with at Monaco, were going to get swept along by the crowd. So I'm really fascinated to see how all these particular things are going to play out. The five subs as well. You may know you cannot make five individual substitutions. If you imagine if, if Arteta makes five individual ones and Guardiola makes five individual ones, we'll be here till the start of next season. So you can only make them in three goes, okay? So I'm really fascinated how that's going to play out. They're playing very quickly. How, you know, sports scientists, the red zone, player going to say, I can't play? I mean, Arsenal got three away. Arsenal's first four games are all away, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Does that matter? How's that going to play out? Things like that. I'm as fascinated as much by anything else, to be honest. I think the media are. One of the things we do know about you, of course, is that you're, a, you're an Arsenal fan. When did you become an Arsenal fan? And can you remember your first, your first Arsenal match? Well, my mum bought me a bag when I was <laughs> six in 1974. I grew up in East Sussex and she went to Rye Market. And she came back and she said, I'm bored of you training your football boots around in a Sainsbury's bag. Here's a, here's a bag. Put them in this. I went, OK. I mean, I love football, obviously. Uh, but and uh, the bag said Arsenal on the outside, and I, you know, I went okay. I, and a lot of you, a lot of you will know how bad Arsenal were in 1974. So no way I was a glory hunter, absolutely no way. Um, some of you with better memories than me will know. Was it was it that season Arsenal was seriously threatened with relegation? That one or the one before? Um, and so that was that. That was sort of it. But it's funny when you make the transformation to working on it because obviously. You don't go very much. But also, I f and I still feel, which is why I don't make it 
public, although people have probably guessed, um, that if you're watching or listening, you deserve to think that there is a level of impartiality coming from the person presenting. So I always, you know, I, you know, I always make a point, and if I'm working with Lee or Ian, they know that anyway, but make a point of saying, listen, I, because I have, when I'm on air, I am impartial, and I hope people would always say that I was impartial. In fact, so a couple of friends have said to me, we know you're an Arsenal fan because you give them such a hard time. Nobody that impartial would give them such a hard time. So I think you, when, when, you, when you go into my business, you have to be slightly sort of um, schizophrenic about it. You know, the, the, the professional side has to, has to take over. But how do you deal with, um, perhaps I, I suppose it, it's the same sort of thing, but that personal conflict that you might feel when... You're, you're watching. You're you're presenting in a in a in a on a match where where you, you hate both the teams or you want one of the teams <laughs> particularly to win or lose for whatever reason. I'm, I think I think I think again, it's just that professionalism that you know. I love football. I love sport. I'm not really you know somebody. I I, I genuinely don't mind most teams. I'm really. In fact, I'll go so far as say there's no team. I I, I don't, really don't mind any team in that respect. I was in. Um, I was in Munich when Chelsea won the Champions League. And I frankly, I felt that Chelsea had so much bad luck in the Champions League. We'll remember that semi-final against Barcelona. I didn't have a grudge than that. I happened to have two sisters, both married to Chelsea fans. So, you know, a legion of Chelsea nephews. So I was quite pleased for my brothers-in-law, who were, you know, old-fashioned Charlie Cook, Peter Osgood fans, as it were. Um, and I think having got to know so many... I mean, I know Glenn Hoddle very well, and I know Chris Waddle very well. And actually, you know... They were fabulous players, as we know, and they were great players for Tottenham. And that, I think knowing people so well in that respect, it sort of dilutes, it dilutes anything I would feel if I would, you know, if I was still standing on the North Bank. I really, I really believe that. Yeah, yeah. And perhaps there's something to be said there in that kind of rational approach to, to, um, to football supporting, which gets lost sometimes in the yeah. tribalism of the game, you know. And I think, I think it gets lost today in the way I don't think it, was quite as acute when I was growing up in the 70s and the early 80s. I mean, it was still pretty tribal, obviously. But I think the way, now listen, I'm in the media, so I'm as guilty as anybody. I think the way that the game is ramped up now so much um, with blogs and phone-ins and the fact that you can say, you can respond immediately to anything. I mean, when I was growing up in the 70s and you were watching Arsenal, if Arsenal played particularly badly on a Saturday, what would you do? How would you vent the, well, you might write a letter to the programme or whatever, but by Monday, everyone had forgotten about it. Whereas now, within 30... I mean, we saw this with the end of the Wenger raid, didn't we? Within 30 seconds, you know, of a game... Well, while a game is happening with Twitter, of course, and then right at the end of the game with phone-ins, you can immediately say what it is. And it feel like we've just... All of us... And as I say, I hate it when people go, the media, people in broadcasting go, the papers say. I mean, that's insulting. We're all in it together. Radio, TV, newspapers. We all do blogs as well. I think we're all guilty of just turning up that Bunsen burner so high now that there's just, it's either absolutely brilliant or it's absolutely appalling. In a way that certainly when I was growing up, well, they're a bit crap today, weren't they? Oh, well, on we go. You know, what time's Parkinson on? You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. So um, perhaps you might tell us about how you got into doing what it is that you, you do. Well, it's, it's a pretty simple... I mean, I grew up... I didn't grow up in a football house, optically, but my dear late dad was absolute cricket at nut. And he loved rugby and he loved racing and he didn't mind football and he tolerated it because of me. But he, he liked... I, he, I wouldn't say supportive, but he liked West Ham. That made 1980 very interesting, obviously. He liked West Ham. I think he liked West Ham because he liked Trevor Brooking because Trevor Brooking was gentlemanly and could play well. Um, and we used to play cricket all summer in the garden. And one evening we were playing, I think it was, must have been a weekend, so we were playing cricket in the garden and we had Test Match Special on and obviously I was, had half an ear on it. And I, I just said to him, are, are these people really being paid to sit in a commentary <laughs> box and watch cricket and eat cake? And he went, yeah, they are. And I went, I mean, but no, seriously, they've been paid to do that. And he went, yes, they are. And I went, well, that sounds like an absolute breeze. That sounds brilliant, doesn't it? And I was about 13, 14 or whatever. And it was one of those things throughout my teenage years, I was sort of thinking about, am I serious? And then my last year at university, I had to make a decision. Was I going to go for it? And I went to radio college. Uh, so I did a three-year degree, as you said, in, in politics at Durham. And then I did a radio degree the year after in uh, the London College of Communication on the Elephant and Castle roundabout, which was great fun. 
And then I started at the bottom working in local radio. I mean, I worked at GLR in London with Garth Crooks. For, I went, Garth was brilliant. Garth is one of the funniest men. And because he found out quite soon, he was really funny. He said to me, I don't hate Arsenal because I played for Tottenham. He said, I hate Arsenal because they beat Stoke in the 1972 Cup semi-final. <laughs> well, well, fair enough, Garth. I said, well, Garth, is any consolation? I saw you score the winner in front of me in the North Bank on New Year's Day in whatever it was, 84 or 85 or 86. So, um, and then I started at the bottom. And then if, when you start at the bottom in radio as I was, you're, you're working in local radio, you're playing for all the shot, as it were, and you hope that Arsenal see you in London and they ask you to, to join them. And you sort of go to the top of local radio and then you go down back to the bottom when you go to, to Radio 5 Live. And then like a lot of people, um, if you're working in radio, after, you know, you work in radio and you think, do I want to do some telly or make the transition across to telly? It's never that straightforward, but that's a sort of fi fairly tried and tested route in the end. This next question has come from my wife and my son, Lewis. What advice would you give to young people? I mean, in a way you've covered it, uh, to enter your profession. What um, advice would you give? No, no, no. There's, you know, there's, there's, there's several things you can do. And I try to, when people say to me, can I, can you talk to my son or daughter about it? I always try to do that because people talk to me when I was, when I was that age. There are several things uh, that you would do. One is you absolutely need to know your subject. So, you know, if it, and obviously it's not just talking about sport or football, whatever it is. So sport, football, cricket, politics, art, music, you need to know what it is. Um, and people say to me, well, how, how come, you know, you seem to know so much about sport? It's because I read the back page from the age of six. You know, it's, I didn't learn it. Unless it's Formula One, I need to learn it. Because forgive me, that's not a sport. I can't bear it. But, you know, basically, I've been reading about it since I was six. So it just builds up knowledge, you know, like sort of, you know, layers of rock. You need to know your subjects. Um, you need to watch and listen as much as you can. And I still do that now. So I watch and listen telly. I'll do it when I watch the news later tonight. I like that. I don't like the way they're doing that. Why are they presenting that way? That's a good phrase. That's a good use of words. You're never too old. You're never too old to learn. You have to fully commit. This is a brilliant business, but it's a really antisocial business. The amount of times I've said to my wife, can't go to that party. Sorry. Can't go to that wedding. I'll meet you later. Can't go on holiday then. The football season's starting. Can't go there. No, it's the FA Cup final, whatever. You have to have a very understanding other half and you have, you can't be the sort of person who goes, I really wanted to go to that. This is your first choice. You have to, I know you have to commit to every job. You've got to fully commit to it because it's fearsomely competitive. You've got to have the hide of a rhino and you've got to understand that, that you're not going to get in everybody's team. Not everybody is going to think that you're the right person. You may not fit for a variety of reasons. They may not think you're any good. They, you're a man, they want a woman. You're a woman, they want a man. You know, there, there are hundreds of reasons why. It is the most subjective business that there is. You know, I've got a great boss at ITV now. He might leave next week. I might have another one. They might, you know, I, I might not suit them. So I hope that answers a lot there, Richard. And, you know, don't be afraid to start at the bottom. In fact, you're going to probably start at the bottom. It's really good fun. It's really, when you're, when you're 22, 23, I worked in London, then I worked in Chelmsford. It was brilliant for two years. I did everything. You know, I commentated, I reported, I did election counts, everything. It's a really rewarding business. And if you like people, I like people. I'm incredibly nosy. I've already asked you, Richard, where you lived. I'm so nosy. You know, it's a really good job if you're curious and you like people and you like to know what makes them tick. You're an Arsenal supporter. You know Arsenal legends. I'm intrigued. When, when, especially when you first worked with them, what was it like working with Lee Dixon, uh, Ian Wright, and Martin Keown? Wrighty, especially perhaps. No, Wrighty, I was Wrighty a bit because I was a, I still am an aging village centre forward. So Wrighty was one of my absolute heroes. Still is one of my absolute heroes. He's actually, I know this is a, I'm trying to think. Yeah, he, uh, of my five Arsenal heroes, he's in there. And, and he's the only striker in there, interestingly. Um, and so that was quite, that was quite intimidating. That, was that intimidating? A little bit, possibly. Lee's just the nicest man on the planet and is just extremely straightforward. <laughs> Martin. I'm working with Martin tomorrow. I love Martin. I mean, he, it's like he's marking somebody in a corner sometimes. You know, he's like jumping around and trying to grab you. And he said to me once, you know, he said to me once, uh, what did you think of my answer? I went, Martin. You play for Arsenal. You play for England. You're an invincible. Uh, 
you can say what you want because you've got all the medals. Just, you know, whatever you say, back it up. So all you have to do, you don't have to justify what you're saying. You get a real, um, you get a real insight into what their character is like. It's very funny. A couple of times I've said to one to the other, I can see what your dressing room might have been like now. You know, when, <laughs> and, and you know, and clearly their stories, particularly about George Graham, absolutely brilliant, absolutely hilarious. Can you tell us one then? <laughs> Just things like Wrighty would say sometimes, he would say that, you know, George would coat him off at half time, make some runs, Wrighty. You know, he wasn't making enough runs down the channel, and obviously Wrighty was and was blaming the midfield for not getting the service and, uh, and you know, and, and, and all that. And then Lee would, you know, Lee would talk us through, and Tony Adams has talked me through it as well, the stories about, you know, the skipping rope on the back four yeah. and how they would do it. I mean, they would do it without a ball. They were sometimes doing it for an hour without a ball. Yeah. Literally just going up and down with a, with a skipping rope. And George would just stand in front of them in different places in front of them, like inside left channel or right wing, and just get them to move accordingly. So that by the end, obviously, it was pure instinct. They knew when the ball was there, where they would go. They, they, they've all said to me since, they don't think the modern day player would put up with that. They don't think the modern day player would be prepared to go through that level of repetition and frankly, boredom yeah. that they did. But obviously, <laughs> doing it brought them the greatest result, greatest rewards. Certainly. But the best, thing, the best thing is, Richard, whenever I'm with any of them, or Glenn Huddle or whatever, or Roy Keane, and they start telling stories, you know, the rest of us, i.e. those who didn't play, just shut up and listen to them, because, you know, they're fantastic stories. Yeah, certainly. I feel I've got to go back on one thing you said, because you said you've got five Arsenal heroes. Yes, yes. And I'm sure we'd love, besides Ian Wright, to know ultimately who they are. Well, my first, because I was born in 1968, is Liam Brady, obvious reasons. Um, my second, because, so I was 14 when he signed, and, ev and you, everybody will agree with me that from about, so after the cup final runs ended and Liam Brady left, the next five or six years were pretty grim, weren't they? Yeah. From, ni from the summer of 1980 onwards. But I love Charlie Nicholas because for, I love the fact that I love the fact that he went to Arsenal, not Man U. I can still remember where I was when I heard that. Yeah. I love the you know, and Arsenal weren't very good, but he was always in the papers because he's always in string fellows, and that was hilarious, wasn't it? it? Was it was hilarious? And obviously, he always scored against Tottenham. I saw him score. Was did he score against Tottenham that day? Yes, I saw him score against Tottenham at White Hart Lane. In what the League Cup game? No, the League game, nineteen eighty-five, yeah, I think it was. Graham Roberts missed a penalty. It was that game. A few of you yeah. would have been there. So I love Charlie Nicholas. And, um, and then Tony Adams is my all-time Arsenal hero because the man was just extraordinary on every level. And, uh, and I love Patrick Vieira. And I know I've left out two of Arsenal's greatest ever players, but everybody, you know, you, can't, you can only have five. You can only yeah. have five. I told Lee's in the top ten. When I, I, I was having, <laughs> one night we had a drink in Paris. He went, well, where am I? I went, don't worry, you're in my top ten. <laughs> in terms of when your work is back to the broadcasting really you know there must be lots of research and preparation in fact you've described some of it earlier do you work basically to a script or is a lot of it I mean I, we imagine a lot of it is improvised because obviously the game is to some extent yeah I mean you, you can't work to a script because this is the whole definition of live sport obviously is you've got to you know I, I write a script uh, I, I mean, but I barely write a script. I mean, in radio, I used to have a skeleton script, but then, you know, you've got to li uh, There's a skeleton script, Richard, but you've got to listen. And too many people on radio and TV simply don't listen to what is said to them. So if I'm doing an England match with Lee and Ian and Roy Keane, you know, there will obviously be some editorial points I need to talk about, you know, Rashford's playing alongside Harry Kane or whatever it is. So I, I want to get those out. Um, because editorially they're really important because if you're watching at home, I would hope you'll be going, oh, the big story today is that, you know, Rashford's playing. So let's talk about that. But too often people don't listen. I mean, as I'm talking about presenters, don't listen to what's said to them. Um, and, and they let things go by. Because there's no right or wrong. It's an art, not a science. Um, and, and, you know, I'm having, a, I'm having a conversation with them, which I'm hoping is, is illuminating and educating and entertaining you at home. So the script is very skeletal. Obviously, on a on the score show on BT on a Saturday, there's no, there's barely well, there is no script because obviously you're literally reacting, and that's where I, that's the one time I really have to research because I need to know what's going on in all the games, what what the implication of all the goals is down to the national league, 
because you have as much right if you support Colchester watching that show that I know that this goal is significant as much as, you know, a goal scored by Arsenal is significant. So that's really, you know, that's, that, that's, really, um, that's really important to me. And it's got to be entertaining. And I think if maybe if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's taught us not to take sport for granted. Don't take sport for granted. And that when it comes back, let's, let's really enjoy it for what it is. You know, I, 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 wherever it started, people say it was Ancelotti, people say it was Shankly or whatever. It's the most important of unimportant things, isn't it, sport? So let's really enjoy it for what it is and try and keep it in the right context. Well, at the same time, acknowledging that you will work hard during the week and that, you know, on a, on a weekend or on a Saturday, going to the Emirates is, is, is one of the high points of the weekend. It's something you look forward to. So don't, I don't want to play it down and say it doesn't matter because, of course, it matters. But I think... Maybe if, if the last three months has taught us anything, let's try and get it in the right spot. You mentioned Roy Keane. It might be gossip. I was interested, I'm interested what it's like to work with him, but does he shave twice on match days? <laughs> I really want to keep my beard till I work with him to see what he says. Just the, thing, the thing about Roy Keane, um, and I remind myself of this all the time, is I, I haven't asked him this, but I'm pretty sure what Roy Keane really respects is professionalism. And if you go back to what he said in that infamous MT, MUTV interview towards the end of his career, you know, they're more interested in their watches and their cars. Basically, what he's saying is they're not concentrating on their jobs of being a professional footballer. And I really, that, that's even, I, I like to think that's what he thinks. So when I work with him, I think, you know, uh, you know, I'm always going to be professional, obviously, but that's at the forefront of my mind. That's what he's really thinking about. He's extremely funny. That probably doesn't surprise you. He is very, very funny. He's got a fantastic sense of humour. Um, it's very, very hard to convince him that a goalkeeper's made a really good save. Because quite often, if I go, what's a hell of a good save? He'll basically say, well, he's got gloves on, hasn't he? <laughs> I think he once got him to admit that Kasper Schmeichel had made a really good save. But he is very, very, um, he's very, he's very entertaining, um, extremely professional. And... I think he's box office. And I don't get, when some people say to me, oh, he's a caricature, he's doing it for effect. I would simply say to that person, do you really think that Roy Keane is bothered about doing anything for effect? Do you really think that? Now, I know the, uh, you lost sound in the Rugby World Cup semi-final or final, <laughs> but that's yeah. rugby. Um, what's the, been the most embarrassing or diff difficult situation to deal with in terms of football presentation? Um, I'm loath to say we haven't had anything too bad. I mean, if things go wrong. It might go back to my answer earlier, but I felt this even before the pandemic. When things go wrong, just say they've gone wrong. I, I, when I was growing up, I think there was a great mystery about how TV was made. And for me, that was shattered when Chris Evans did the Big Big Breakfast show. What was that? Probably 20 years ago now. And he started saying, Richard, your camera too. Have a look at Drew on camera one. Look how hungover he is. Look at his shoes. They're terrible. And then we started seeing on screen the cameraman. So one cameraman would turn around and actually show what the other cameraman looked like. And for me, it shattered the mystique for everybody at home. Oh, of course TV is made like that. We know it. My point being, if things go wrong, I, 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 no one really minds. I mean, they, don't mind if you, they mind if you swear or libel something, clearly. But, you know, it's, that's yeah. the boss's mind in that as well. But if you get something wrong, I mean, I, you know, I get things wrong all the time. I just laugh about it, like the Rugby World Cup semi-final. I, do, I, don't, I don't think people, people just don't mind because they know, how, they know how it's made. I don't think I've had an... Well, I'm so loath to say that, Richard. I'm touching everything here. <laughs> I probably will. I tell you the one thing I don't do, when other presenters have nightmares, I never, oh, I never watch that back. Oh, well, that's funny, isn't it? Look at him or her. That, that, that's called karma. You do that, it's coming your way. Because sometimes it's not their fault. You know, you lose. I mean, I lost sound that time. We lost, we lost complete uh, communication with the truck. It was after the semi-final, and it was my friend Sophia, who is a mad gooner. She's a season ticket holder in the North Bank. She is the auto queue lady, best auto queue lady in the country by miles. And I wasn't sure whether you were on air or not. So we sort of just gently started talking. And then I looked up and I saw the camera. And it's you just typing, keep talking. We're on air. <laughs> it's when you need people on your side. I imagine radio training was very useful for that. Radio training is brilliant. Uh, radio training is brilliant for that. We, we, I was doing a, uh, a Europa League roundup about three years ago with Glenn Hoddle. 
it was a two and a half minute roundup, you know, the rest of the scores. And five seconds before he went to it, they said to my ear, we've lost the tape. We're going to have to talk for two and a half minutes. <laughs> so I just talked. And at the end, we went to an hour break and go and went, that's radio for you. Went, yeah, you know. I mean, I, well I, you know, I did that for 25 years, you know, standing on the, court, on the touchline just talking. Besides Liverpool beating Spurs in the Champions League, what was your most exciting moment doing the job? <laughs> um, probably, Aguero, uh, probably Aguero's goal. Yeah. Probably Aguero's goal, which is, as we all know, the second best finish to a league season ever. Pro because cause we really thought it had gone and Man City fans were streaming out behind us and they were in tears. And one of my best mates is a Man City fan. And even I was thinking, I cannot believe you cocked this up. I mean, the QPR were terrible. And then when they scored, I picked up my mic and sprinted, not very far from the radio box, the touchline. And I had what we call um, a radio mic. So, you know, I didn't have to be tethered to a desk. It, it had a frequency. So when Aguero scored, I sprinted down to an area we'd been told we could go to when the game finished. And all these Man City fans were grabbing me as I ran down and going, it's the best day of my life, you know. And it just, you know, it, must, it was probably what it was like to be in Anfield that night. It was, it was extraordinary finish. That and probably Liverpool in Istanbul was fairly amazing. Liverpool in Istanbul was fairly amazing. But the Liverpool and Istanbul and Chelsea and Munich were both very similar, where, where there was a moment you knew they were going to win. Liverpool's was when um, Dudek saved from Shevchenko, which was just a freak. And obviously, Chelsea, when, um, when Robert missed the penalty, Steve Bruce was with us on radio. And I just turned to Steve and I went, they're going to win now. And he went, yeah, they're going to win. You, you, I mean, I'm sure you felt the same at home. You know what I mean? You know that's, it. Sometimes it's written in the stars. Man United 99 was written in the stars, wasn't it? Burkamp scores, Arsenal probably win the double. Oh, don't bring it up, please. But, you know, it's meant to be sometimes. Arsenal fan TV. What, what uh, do you all professional broadcasters think of them? Well, I like, I, like, I like the fact they've given the fans a voice, an instant voice. I just think with it, you've got to be aware of your responsibility to it. That's all I would say. Now, I don't know Robbie, but Robbie's brother I know well, who's a lovely bloke. And I'm sure Robbie's a very nice man. I would just say you've got to be responsible when it, when it, when it comes to it. Yeah. I think, uh, uh, it's a slightly British thing that somebody comes up with an idea, makes a success of it, and then we all want to slag them off. You know, we all want to criticise them. I would just say, as I say, I would just say remember your level of responsibility with it. And I think it, 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 it got popular at just the right moment, didn't it? Because yeah. a, a fans TV station is never going to be popular if you're mid-table and bumping along. It's not necessarily going to be that popular if you're winning everything in sight, because there's nothing to talk about. But obviously, chiming with the end of the Wenger era, oh my, and obviously with the sort of polemic involved in that, if you like, it was, it was the perfect time for it. But I've never criticised them for being entrepreneurial. I've certainly never criticised them for giving them a voice. You might disagree with them. Obviously, you've already mentioned Arsene. What a dream to have met him. Um, the, great, met the, best thing, the best thing about Wenger was, the be I, I interviewed him a lot in the early days, not so much in the last six or seven years. The best thing about Wenger was you could ask him anything. You could yeah. literally ask him anything. And th there was a time um, in the beginning of that season four or five when England were winning the Ashes finally after 18 years. People asked him about that. He gave a brilliant, he, he, he gave a brilliant answer. He basically said, Typical Vega, he went, I don't really understand cricket, but I understand this means an awful lot to an awful lot of you, and I'm really pleased and, you know, you know, good luck, England, and carry on. He was brilliant like that because he was such an intelligent man. He, he understood what was going on in the country and how much it meant, and so wasn't going to, you know, poo-poo it. He wasn't going to go, oh, I'm not interested in that. And that was, that was the best, that was absolutely the best thing about him. And my friends who were in tunnels over the years, the reporters in tunnels, particularly when I was on radio, would just text me and go, had a lovely, you know, sort of hop us too. Had a lovely chat with Vega for 20 minutes. Charming. We talked about all sorts of things and asked her about a kickoff wherever. I mean, uh, it just was a proper human being. I mean, there are lots of things I'd like to ask him from, from <laughs> Arsenal's point of view. Obviously, you've meant, we've talked about Arsene. You must have worked closely with Ferguson, Mourinho, Guardiola, Klopp. Any... Uh sort of thoughts, words that you could share about comparisons, perhaps, or any I think, thoughts about I think, them? 
I think, interesting with George Graham, there are so many um, phases in sport, aren't there? There are so, you know, this is the way we play a particular way. And then that comes through an era. Look at Wales. They played a particular way rugby for years under Warren Gatlin. Now they play a different way. England got to world number one cricket under Andy Flower, playing a particular way. He leaves. They understand they have to change the way. I think Alex Fergus and George Graham were very much men of their time. I don't th- I think, you know, Fergie's retired now eight years ago. Yeah. I don't, I think they all, I think they would accept you can't manage that way. So I think what's really fascinating about these people is those who recognize, well, what, what's happened up till now as well? Not their teams, because Fergie changed, in particular changed his teams brilliantly, but the way that I manage has worked for so long. It's not going to work so much now. You know, as everyone says, you've got a bunch of multimillionaires. You drop me, well, I'll just get my agent to get me another team. So I, th- I, think that I think what it is, is this, this issue of man management is absolutely fascinating. Guardiola is obviously really good at it. And if I can say, I did an interview with Arteta for PLP on Thursday. And he, made a, he gave a really good answer, basically saying, I was asking him about obviously playing behind closed doors and with no crowd. And he said, I've got 12 dif- different nationalities in my team. I cannot treat them all the same way. So I think the demands on these managers now to have that, um, to have that intelligence, and if you like to have that sort of mental agility to go, oh right, Richard, you'll behave one way, Drew, you'll behave another way, as much because of where you come from, is really fascinating, and it must be exhausting for them as well. So, in other words, Fergie was one way, was it? Fergie and George were one way. I mean, Lee Dixon has said it lots of times: you play this way, you don't play. Look at Mickey Thomas. Mickey yeah. Thomas, Thomas didn't want the ball sailing over his head anymore, did he? So he went to Liverpool. Well, George put him in the reserves. Two, in, under two years after scoring the goal of all time, he's in the reserves. You couldn't do that anymore. It's not one size fits all now. The managers have to be so adept mentally and in terms of man management about how everybody is going to react. Otherwise, the players just go, well, otherwise they just go, you're paying me 100 grand a week, I'll sit on the bench, or I'll go and play for someone else. Yeah. It, anything about Mourinho, Guardiola or Klopp? Um. Mm. I think I, uh, what I'm fascinated by Mourinho is I'm absolutely fascinated. Can he coach his way out of this? I mean, what he did was was fantastic. You clearly, you know, obviously he was way out of order with the Voyeur. We know he was way out of order. Um, but, you know, his record up until then at Man United was fabulous, even if it's short term. Can he coach his way out of this? I think everybody, including my Tottenham friends, are fascinated by that because he's, I, I, I was, as I said, I was working with Ian Wright and Tim Sherwood last week. And I said to Tim, what do you think about Mourinho and the Tottenham fans? And he went, I think it's 50-50 at the moment. So can he coach his way out of that? And Klopp, well, you have to take your hat off to him, don't you? I mean, it's extraordinary. You have to take your hat off to him. Why isn't he the Arsenal manager? <laughs> Always wanted well, him. Yes, yeah, I, I, absolutely. But we all know why not, because the board wanted... Arson yeah. to make his own decision, didn't he? But I think Klopp, Klopp and Klopp, Guardiola, are but are, are, I think what is absolutely evident now is clearly you'll never see a Ferguson or Wenger again. Is how long is the shelf life? I would say, is this Klopp's fifth season? It might be his fifth season, fourth or fifth. The, the shelf life is six years max for me. I'd be surprised if it's that much. Um, and so, and it works, and the players listen to it. But the players, in the end, want to you know get used to too used to the voice, don't they? They got too used to Arsene Wenger's voice. I think we would, we would all agree with that, probably. Because when you start getting too used to it, you start taking advantage of it. So I think, uh, I think that's what's really... I mean, you know, Guardiola a bit sensational. May well with the Champions League this season. And Klopp, well, it's out of this world what he's done, isn't it? It's absolutely out of this world what he's done. You've mentioned Arsene leaving. What was it like working around, with him around that time, uh, you know, interviews with Arsene and everything knowing all that was in the background it got it got it got difficult actually because it got personal didn't it I mean and I went to the Emirates to work quite a lot those two seasons um and people probably know well the the TV gantry is is in the hang on, never each really with the top of the west and um the radio one was at the bottom and it got you know so you could hear everything and people streaming past you so one particularly noisy cab driver from probably not far from you, Richard, actually. <laughs> it's actually quite funny how noisy it was. But you just, you know, and I'd be there with Lee Dixon or Dion Dublin or whatever and people, and you just go, this, this isn't really the way anybody wants it to finish. It got, it got quite, 
it got quite unpleasant in the last 18 months. What about Arsene himself? How did In that you know, time? Yeah. I thought he dealt with it pretty well. I mean, he got put under pressure in interviews, and rightly yeah. so. I mean, the interviews were, were, were completely fair enough, I felt. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wonder if he was a bit relieved in the end. Anything about uh, what was it like with Emery? And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really, um, I didn't really come across Emery. I thought he started well, but then I, he, I think what we all thought was quite brave his substitutions at half time. So many of them quite soon became well. This bloke never gets his team right to start with. You know what I mean, I think quite quickly flopped into that. Clearly, his lack of English, uh, you know, command of English was a problem. I felt a bit sorry for him on the good evening. I was probably as guilty as anybody to my friends on text. I'm sure I was. I felt a bit sorry for him on that. But I think he just lost his way a bit, didn't he? Yeah. He just seemed to lose his he just seemed to lose his way a bit. I think Arteta's very, very bright. And going back to what Tim Sherwood said to me on Thursday, I said to him, So what do you think about Arsenal and Tottenham now? And he goes, the big difference is Arsenal have got a manager who wants to coach his way out of it. Not sure, you know yeah. You know, he clearly, Arteta, uh, Tim Show did his coaching badges with Arteta. And he wants to coach his way out of it. And I think that's really exciting. I think it's really exciting to see if he can do it. Arsenal got a very good academy. And it may well be they're going to have to use, well, they are using the academy already. And he's going to have to sort out Saka's contract and where Saka are going to play because of Tierney. But he's got, you know, Maitland-Niles, everyone says, is suddenly, I think he might have had a bit of a, uh, you know, a slate wiped clean. Can yeah. he coach his way out of it? Yeah. And I think if he can, you as the crowd will respond to that even more than if he bought, you know, six one hundred million pound players. Do you know what I mean? Because we go here's some kids. You you go back to the Anfield team, and we all know who was in that team. We all know how many came through the youth team. We all know what George Graham was left. You know the core of that Anfield team. So I think that's I think that's actually potentially really exciting to see if he can do. They may not be able to, or we all know what happens. Players, not everyone is going to make it, but. He really wants to do this, and he's been, you know, he really coaching is his thing. He is a coach. He's yeah. a coach. So there's the challenge, isn't it? I, and I, I would hope that that people would find that quite exciting. It is. It'd be lovely to think of it being coached. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, to be fair, to be fair, Emery was a coach. To be fair, I think his message just got muddled. I mean, he's yeah. definitely a coach. Yeah. Anything you'd like to see change at the Arsenal at the moment? So what I'd like to see is, is, and I would definitely like to see, more engagement from the owners with people like yourselves and with the supporters' trust and everybody. Because that, you know, clearly the, the, the forcing of the sale of the shares was, I thought, was unnecessary and wasn't really what Arsenal have been over the years. So I would like to see, I would like to see more engagement and a closer relationship and obvious interest from Josh Cronkey with the fans. I'm wondering how you see football changing, for good or for bad, perhaps, in the next 12, 18 months. I mean, can it continue in the same format well, it is, or are we going to need to adjust to a different sort of league setup? Well, I, 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 I'm most fascinated by all, all, all you um, men and women who are obviously paying, as we know, the highest prices in the land, and everyone's gone through a tough time financially. I really are still expecting everybody to stump up exactly the same price for next season. That is, as long as you can all go, because I can't see how, as things stand, you can have 60,000 of the Emirates in, let's call it the 1st of September, for argument's sake. So th that is going to be absolutely fascinating. Is this going to be a wake-up call for football clubs to stop taking their fans for granted? Because they've taken you for granted. There's no question about that. Mm. I mean, you're the classic example, aren't you, as Arsenal fans, with the prices you've paid... And constantly being told, oh, it's jammed tomorrow, it's jammed tomorrow. Well, <laughs> Ivan Gazidis kept telling you that, didn't he? Oh, it'll all come good, don't worry about it. I felt a bit sorry for Arsenal because they hitched their wagon to, you know, financial fair play and then the goalposts were moved. So I think, Drew, that is, the for me, the biggest thing is how many fans are going to be allowed in and are they really expecting that everybody will be able, will be willing to pay the prices they have been? Yeah, I mean, we had a question in the chat from, um, from John and he'd asked... Um, He'd heard um, that the government want next season to start in August with full attendance. I mean... Um, well, I don't see how you can do that without a vaccine myself. No, I mean, that's, that's, what, that's well, what I was thinking, yeah. yeah. Well, the other thing is, the other thing is I, I, I know obviously lots of you will sit together with friends, but some of you 
won't always sit next to people you know you know like you might be the end of a row or you've swapped tickets with somebody so you, you may well sit next to somebody you don't know and um and with the best one in the world you might have driven there but quite a lot of you have gone by train and maybe by tube do you really want to do all that i mean does is does that does that not feel maybe quite a risk to your own health particularly if you have had health problems yeah no, i think feel, it feels quite a big mental jump for me that does in yeah. everything, obviously not just football, in every, in, in, in the theatre, in sport, in the cinema, and all of it. So in that case, I mean, do we think television's role, television, particularly television, but also I guess other broadcast media like radio, does that change if fans aren't allowed back into the grounds until say the spring? Well, well, clearly that might have to. But the interesting thing for me that is, and um, obviously Arsenal are amongst this. All those owned by Americans, Arsenal, Man U, Liverpool, particularly. Of course, if in America you can watch it, you can watch your get your team in every game. Mm. I think I'm right in saying whatever the sport is. Obviously, America's massive, so people aren't going to be travelling in the way that we are. But I'm sure that's what American owners want. They want to say to you, Drew, do you really want to go to Newcastle today? You just sit. You know, it's a Tuesday night for argument's sake. You can sit in your chair and watch it. There's nothing to do with Sky or BT. You know, you pay your season ticket to Arsenal and you can watch it that way. So I'm. I'm curious to know whether if we can't have the, the numbers and the crowds that we've had up till now for, because of COVID reasons, whether that might just encourage the, the, those owners to try and drive this through. Now, the big part of that is, is, is still you need two thirds of the clubs to sanction it. And that's what's kept the Premier League with its collective bargaining um, <coughs> uh, strength over all these years. Because obviously in Spain, Real Madrid and Barcelona, you can do all that. So you can watch every single game wherever you are. But I'm curious to know that if we can't have the crowds in there, whether this is a chance for those owners to maybe drive through, you know, a bit of a Trojan horse when it comes to that. Mm, that's really interesting. I mean, I think that, I mean, we were also wondering, I had a question in from a, um, a member by email and um, sort of thinking about the international game. I mean, the international, it's, it's not just the international game, but it's also our domestic game and, and how it's changed over the years. So, I mean, reflecting back quite some time, but in nineteen in the nineteen thirties, there were seven Arsenal players in the England yes. side. Yeah. I mean, uh, I doubt we're ever going to see that again. Well, it's possible, I suppose. Um, but I wonder what might happen with football in the domestic game if, um, in the you know, the, in the aftermath of COVID nineteen, and of course with Brexit, which is looming on the horizon. <laughs> um, and you know all the all the kind of questions we might have about reduced revenues for players, um, about the loss of freedom of movement, all sorts of things like that. I guess. Well, well, I, I mean, you've already seen it with your old friend Giroud, who didn't want to leave Chelsea because he didn't want to move. He didn't want to move countries. He wanted to stay where he was. This may it's may play to Arsenal's advantage with Aubameyang. It may play to Arsenal's advantage. Do you really want to go to another country? Uh, you know, at the back end of a pandemic, where you don't quite know what's going over there. Um, it's also 32, so people aren't going to pay the money they were five months ago. Mm. You know, they're, they're, you're not going to pay 70 million now for a Bamiyang, which you might have done five years ago, even though he's about to be 32. Oh no, there's going to be a lot of this, there's, there's going to be a lot of knock on effects, I think, of this. I think there's going to have to be a lot of uh, adaptability, a lot of flexibility, but it may mean that there's less, there's less movement, uh, uh you know, a, a th across countries because people. Are thinking well I know where I am and I'm, I, I'm safe and more to the point my family are safe and I don't have to worry about them so mm. I think I think it's going to be it's going to be very interesting to see if that has a knock-on effect I mean it's different <laughs> if you're 22 year old Havertz from Germany you know Chelsea are going to pay you 200 grand a week or whatever but pl particularly for players at the other end of their careers who've got families there may well be much more of a decision to make than straightforward yeah I want to I want to win the league I'm going to go and play for them mm. And, and I mean, I've got another question in the chat, which is also on our minds this week. I mean, well, the last couple of weeks with the Black Lives Matter, the, the, the killing of George Floyd. I mean, that's obviously a very big media story. Yeah. Um, I mean, some players have um, made some very public broadcasts about that recently. Um, and I, and talking about going to um, the authorities are going to allow some players to take the knee if that's what they want to do. Yeah. And I wonder how you as broadcasters are going to cover cover this because it you know on one level it's not controversial and on another level it's become quite controversial well well the uh, um arteta said to me last week that Aubameyang rang him before the brentford game and said we want to do this and arteta said absolutely i support you i support you all the way 
I think I think it's just part of what's going on in society, and that it's Ian Wright said this to me on on my World program on Thursday. He said it's hopefully now moved it to a point. You know, the, the, a line has been drawn in the sand, and we've gone beyond that point now, where we talk about this regularly and we point it out and we flag it up as we should do, as we should have been doing for years. And it is significant that Arsenal are doing it because, and, and it's not me saying this because I asked Ian write this, Arsenal's probably the most multiracial club in the country in many ways, isn't it? Mm. I mean, Arsenal's very, been very proud of how many black players have played for, for Arsenal. And, and I would hope still that, you, and you'll know better than me, the multiracial um, makeup of the crowd as well. Um, and so I think, you know, we've got to the stage, you know, that we've got to the stage where we've had this conversation so much and we know how much uh, good can be done through sport and we know how much social change can be flagged up by things in sport that having crossed this line, that we'll carry on talking about it. And the broadcasters will, there's no issue about that. I mean, that absolutely they will. That's good. That's really good. Yeah. Okay. So a few quick ones, if I can. Sorry, as they should with Marcus Rashford as well. Absolutely. As they yeah. should with Marcus Rashford. And it was interesting, wasn't it, that whatever it was, six weeks ago, Matt Hancock was saying, any chance of football is doing something, please. Since when the, the captains, who had got together already by that stage, and have raised millions for the NHS charities, and now Marcus Rashford's doing extraordinary things for a 22-year-old in Manchester to be doing. Yeah. Um, and one of our own centre halves has been some, doing some very good work around the um, around the Emirates. I, I have no doubt that Arsenal have been doing. Arsenal in the community is a strength of the club and always has been. I have no doubt that Arsenal have been doing um, so much. Been doing a huge amount of the community because it's it's such a well established, well run, and successful community project. Mm. Okay, so. Um... So a few quick ones that have come in. So there's, um, do you have a favourite a favourite sport autobiography? Any sport, um, really. But... Oh my gosh. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, I, I, I love Terry Neal's autobiography. Do you remember that one all those years ago? It was great, wasn't it? It was really good. Um, do I have a favourite? Yes, I do. Um, I tell you what, I really like Ricky Ponting's, actually. Oh, I want to read yeah. Ricky Ponting's. Shane Warns was hilarious. Football-wise, <laughs> have I got any football ones in here? I can't think. I think I can't think the part since Terry Nils is a football. Oh well, no, no. Tony Adams is addicted. Was extraordinary, wasn't it? Mm, yeah. Tony Adams. Tony's story is extraordinary. Thank you for saying that. Revelations of a football manager. I remember I, that was a great book. Tony Adams as well. Uh, that addicted was phenomenal. Okay, and you, this is um, a question that's coming about um, a former colleague of yours, Alan Green. Um, so it was, was for, for many years known as the leading critic of referees on the radio um, and suddenly one day out of the blue um, he, he kind of stopped really talking so much about referees I mean well, has there ever really been anything in broadcast about not criticising referees because obviously football fans do that all the time I, no not to my not to my knowledge there hasn't been not to my knowledge I think but I think everything when you're in my job has to you have to be um Self-aware is what I'm looking for. Mm. And you have to be able to go, I think I'm talking about that a bit too much. And that's probably getting a bit boring. I mean, that's, that's the attitude I take towards it. But there's certainly nothing in terms of a diktat, don't, you know, don't mention this or when it comes to refereeing and things like that. No. Okay. And um, do, you, do you think, is it, do you have a sort of a, um, a favourite ever commentator or the one you would rate the most highly, you know, now or in, or in the past, um, really? Do you know what we we did a we did a series of uh, the, yeah two or three I love John Murray now and he's a great friend and he's got a wonderful accent and he's a tremendous human being I love John I'm sure you enjoy him on the radio uh, a, a lot and I did a um, a series uh, for ITV so ITV as you probably know re-showed the whole of Euro '96 and we did a series of podcasts to run alongside it which are still up there if you want to listen Tony Adams was extraordinary to start with and it just reminded me how brilliant to commentator Brian Moore was and you forget about it because sadly he's been passed so long now and he just and obviously it's 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 so evident in the Michael Thomas moment he was never hurried he never sounded surprised his pace was brilliant he always had the right way with words always reached the right crescendo at the, at the right moments I thought Brian Moore was brilliant and I was I confess I was a Barry Davis fan as well I rather, <laughs> I rather liked it when Barry told people off it always made me laugh so in football, I go Brian Moore, uh, Barry Davis, and, and John. Okay. And do you do you read any of the Arsenal blogs? Um, 
No, uh, I used to read Arsenal News Review, but I, I don't know whether it still goes or not. I don't. No, not but. Not particular. Uh, I, no, I listen to Ask Blog occasionally when they do an interview. I listened to that interview with Fabregas, which I thought was brilliant. Mm. I thought the interview with Fabregas was absolutely brilliant. I thought it was terrific. So there's a space perhaps there for the non-professionals in all of this. I mean, I wonder, one of the things we can't all be saying from the beginning of this with Zoom and stuff is actually how people are getting more used to doing this kind of stuff themselves. I, I, and I think that's a massive strength for the for the whole of the sort of football watching fraternity. There doesn't just have to be professionals like me who does it. That it's actually, it's 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 you know when it comes from the heart, it's more interesting really. You know things things like um, Ask Blog and uh, Boyd Hilton and, and Josh Landy are good pals of mine. I've been on Footballistically Arsenal. You know I try and go on once or twice a season. I think it's it's really entertaining when it comes from from these people. I think I think the sort of um, diversification of the media has allowed that and i think i think that's brilliant i think that's absolutely i think that's brilliant and then when you get things like ask blog managing to get a fabric ass interview well that just shows isn't it that it shows when you look at it from the other side that the players are taking it seriously now i know he had a link through his fabric ass's landlady didn't he or whatever it was but it was <laughs> a really good interview and i listened to it with a professional head on i listened to it with a professional head on going would i ask anything different i would have pushed him harder in a couple of places probably mm. just professionally but i I thought, personally, I thought Fabregas came across really well. Mm. I actually thought he came across really well. And I've got a question which came in on the chat earlier, um, which was actually going back to that, um, probably the best film of all time, which was um, 89. I don't know if you've seen it, but the, um, <laughs> that film that they've managed to put on, managed to be on Sky quite recently. Yeah, Brad yeah. Um, and um, one, of the, one of the people asking on the chats was, was quite, quite reasonably saying that was, it was a brilliant film. But it had no Liverpool perspective. And I wondered what you thought about that. I mean, in some respects, as a broadcaster and a filmmaker, should it have had more or something for Liverpool? I, I, I watched it when it was on about three weeks ago, wasn't it? No, about a month ago in lockdown. I watched it with my wife, um, who's obviously got used to all these things now. And uh, I said, what did you think? She said, I really enjoyed it. She said, I really enjoyed the anchoring of it in the social times, you know, the music, the fashion, you know, the early brick mobile phones, obviously uh, I thought they were incredibly sensitive about Hillsborough. They told it really well against the backdrop of Hillsborough. I didn't, I didn't particularly come away thinking uh, that it missed the Liverpool aspect because it was one of those, we all knew the, we all knew that, you know, we knew the whodunit. We knew the whodunit at the end. Mm. Um, I, the last thing I did before lockdown was an interview with John Barnes, which went around the world. And he was brilliant about the moment. He was absolutely brilliant. So I said, go on, John, why didn't you run it to the corner flag? And, uh, you know, he knew it was coming. I think I probably told him it was coming. And he went, you can't, he said, you can't, he said, you, you know, you, you might as well say, you know, why did I miss a sitter against QPR in December and it finished 1-1 instead of 2-1? You know, he was, he was really, he was really interesting about it. He just sort of, you, you, it just because it was the last moment of the last game, that's why everybody remembers it so. Yeah, and he's right in a way, isn't it? That moment, it's only because of the, the, the context of it that we all remember it so much. As I say, we probably don't remember the miss against QPR in December, which, you could, which is just as, just as important in terms of points which were lost. But no, I, I, don't, I didn't particularly... Did you feel I was missing the Liverpool angle? No, not personally. I mean, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite partisan. Um, I, I was wondering if from a... I think actually it worked really well as a... I thought it worked really well. I yeah. thought it worked really well. Great, right, but yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my, most of my Liverpool friends chose not to watch it, though. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just, I just. Said I've got two. I've got two great pals. Uh, uh, one of my best friends I watched with that night, just him and me at university. And um, when Alan Smith scored, I threw a pot plant at him. No, no, I threw a pot plant at him when they tried to get the goal ruled off. I went, "You've got to be kidding!" He's clearly, and you know, I've asked Alan a hundred times. I see him regularly. Saw him at Cheltenham. I, uh, yes, I, it went in. And um, and. Uh, so I texted him the other night, I just texted him a picture of Steve McMahon holding up his finger. So yeah, <laughs> I just do that occasionally. Yeah. So, um, okay, so another couple of quick ones here. Um, your um, favourite your, your favorite or, your, or the worst ground for commentating at? And not necessarily just the football, particularly. Um, well, the new Camp's amazing. I know you were right up in the gods, you guys, when you were, you'd have been there a few times. I, I think I saw all the Arsenal games there. The, the Van Persie sending off, which was criminal. 
Never got over it. <laughs> Never. Didn't Bentner miss a great chance to win it right at the end? I yeah. think he did, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. Um, that's brilliant. I, I think I love the Bernabeu, though. And I was there, as you all were, for Henri's goal. I love the Bernabeu. Um, worst ground for commentating. Well, that's a bit unfair because you go further down the league, the, you know, the conditions aren't great. I tell you, actually, where is terrible. Old Trafford's a disgrace. Old Trafford... But... Understandably, if you say that, no one's interested in the radio complaining about it. It is so cramped. I mean, literally, you have to be hoiked out by a crane after four hours. I mean, that is, it is a disgrace. Um, but, but the Bernabeu, I, I thought the Bernabeu was an astonishing place. Hmm. Yeah, someone says their seats at Old Trafford are very cramped. I'm not surprised, yeah. But, well, but we all know what's going on at Old Trafford. The Glazers aren't spending any money on the ground. That's why it's the same. I first went to Old Trafford to work 20 years ago. It's identical. I did go to Old Trafford once as a fan. Unbelievably, Arsenal won. Charlie Nicholas scored quite late on. I remember <laughs> that was that was a very entertaining day. So, do you think the seats at the Emirates are too big and create just a too passive atmosphere? I think I, you know when I said coaches are of their time. Grounds are of their time. I haven't been to the new Tottenham ground. I, I genuinely haven't been, but it's clearly extraordinary. But the but the Emirates was extraordinary then. It's what. <laughs> No, I, th I think the Emirates is a really comfortable stadium. It's not Highbury. Nowhere's Highbury. Mm. But I mean, uh, uh, Arsenal, you know, should they have moved? Well, we were all told they were moving to compete with Bayern Munich by Mr. Gazidis, weren't we? <laughs> well, let's finish on the positive then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> finish, not on that. So I'll finish on the positive and say, OK, what's your prediction then? Obviously, Liverpool are going to win the league. Yeah. Um, I think Arsenal will come. I think Arsenal will come. Where are Arsenal now? Ninth. They'll probably come seventh, maybe, maybe sixth. But in a way, in a way, in a way, if you can keep a Yang and sign, I don't know, Thomas Party or whatever, you might be better out of being out of all European competition next season. Didn't Chelsea win the league having been out of all European competition? Didn't they? They weren't in anything. You might, you might even be better off. Now, of course, the finances are also such that even the Europa League is a little bit of sucker. But if you can keep the main players and, and add a couple, you have to generate sales by selling a couple. You might be better off by, by being out of all of it um, and therefore able just to give Arteta another bit of a pre-season. Obviously, Saliba's coming in. Another centre-back's needed, isn't it? Um, and, then, and then just see where, where things are next season. But there's a lot, you know, also got a lot of away games, haven't they? Mm. Coming up. I think it's going to, well, clearly not going to be in the Champions League. Clearly not. Wherever they finish, you just want to see you want to see a gradual improvement. We'll we'll you know be fascinated to see if that is the case. I, I'm I'm really really fascinated to see wherever Arsenal finish this season. I'm really fascinated. Lee always used to say to me, Lee Dixon, at their best, all the games you remember, Veng used to say, go play. Well, you can go play when you've got Vieira, Petit. Still think that, for me that's the best Arsenal team of all time, 97, 98, but I may be on my own there. Vieira, Petit, Bergkamp, and obviously then Henri, and and you know, they're all the defense. You can say go play to that team, can't you? Because they're all bloody brilliant. But you know, you now need to be in a situation where you're coached. And I'm really, really interested to see, not just Arsenal, we taught them as well, actually, you know, what 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 the coaching is. Because we can see what's happened with the coaching with, with Liverpool and City.